Thank you for attending tonight. We will be getting started in about one minute. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for attending tonight's education series that KMC puts on for a quarterly basis. And tonight we're gonna to be talking about landscaping, ponds, um, trees, and we have some education in regards to this with some experts from the industry. And tonight, um, Dan Quickly, who is our Vice President of the Association Division for KMC is unable to attend. He's attending a further education class tonight. So I am Leah Mesmore. I am a regional manager for Kirkpatrick Management. And I will be viewing the chat bar as we go through the, the seminar tonight. And I will be taking your questions through the chat bar. We do have breaks in between and I'll be reading them at that time. And also tonight presenting is Michael Murphy. He is also a regional manager for Kirkpatrick Management. And Michael joined Kirkpatrick Management in 2015. And he is um, has a background of retail management over 10 years. And he also has received from Kirkpatrick the Rising Star Award and has been accredited with Certified Manager Association Certificate and also the Association Management Specialist Certificate. So also adjoining tonight with Michael is Aaron Eberhard with Brightview. He is their market sales manager. Jonathan Wynn with BAM Outdoor. He is their account manager and a certified arborist. And Kevin McLaughlin with ASAP Aquatics. He is their senior account manager. Um, before I turn it over to Michael, again, if you can put your questions in the chat bar and I'll read them during the question and answer time. At the end of the seminar tonight, we'll be giving out two gift cards to the participants. So stay on towards the end and you may be able to win a gift card. And I will turn it over to Michael. Thanks, Leah. Um, we will get started here. Let me get our PowerPoint up. All right, as Lee said, we're going to talk about um, you know, common practices for pond maintenance, uh, landscaping, tree maintenance, and uh, some best practices for uh, requests for proposals. Um, but we're going to start off with uh, Aaron discussing uh, the landscaping portions of our communities. Thanks, Michael. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Aaron Eberhard with Brightview Landscapes. Uh, tonight, I kind of want to cover common practices within the landscape industry. Um, issues that we are facing in 2022 and what the outlook uh, is, what we foresee it to be, and how do we improve our efficiencies and maximize our, our dollars that we're spending in the industry. Um, it's obviously one of the largest expenses an HOA has. So with the issues that are arising from the market and the economy, how do we maximize our efforts um, and still get a good product? Uh, so. Those are the topics I wanna to take uh, into consideration tonight. Um, we're gonna to talk about turf care, fertilization, weed control, flowers, mulch, pruning, go through uh, the gamut. 
and uh, you know, post your questions in the uh, in the chat, and we will discuss those here at the end. All right. First and foremost is obviously turf care. Um, one of the one of the items we face in the industry most most requests that come in are, are getting the uh, the grass cut shorter. Um, in the in this year, it's going to be important, and in most years, it's always important to keep your grass three inches or higher. Uh, this helps keep weeds uh, weed pressure down, allows uh, does not allow the weeds to get sunlight and some of the nutrients they need to grow. So keeping a longer uh, turf, the three and a half to four inch uh, mark is going to be crucial this year. Um, we don't want to drop the decks below that three inch mark because we, we face a lot of scalding issues, burnout, disease, a lot of different things come from that. So uh, it's going to be important to, to have your vendor stay at that three inch or above, uh, ideally three and a half inches, uh, and make sure that regular mowing is occurring. Um, like I discussed, uh, we're, we're, we're getting into a year where it's going to be a little tough and a little bit more extensive. So mulching grass and leaves is going to be one of the most efficient ways um, to reduce one of those costs that you have, and also disease. Um, mulching of the grass and, and leaves is great for the soil. It's great for the nutrients returning to the soil. And um, as long as you're not getting a lot of buildup and creating a shield to block those nutrients from getting to the soil, uh, I would suggest having a mulching mower, a mulching deck on the mowers to improve uh, the health of your turf. Um, turf types are gonna be another, uh, another subject. Uh, and this can go into a cost, uh, cost reduction as well. By reducing the amount of high, um, you know, high need grass seeds, like a blue grass seed, or you know, something that needs a lot of fertilizer, a lot of water to stay uh, lush and pretty, uh, I would consider using fescues. Uh, in a time like now, if not every year, it reduces the amount of water you need to put down. Um, mowing, um, it, it tends to do better with a higher mow, is around that three and a half inch to four inch deck. Um, and it just helps control those costs uh, that, a, that a bluegrass might have. Um, also, if we're gonna DIY and patch things in, I would uh, encourage you to go with a 100% seed stay away from any creepers or ryegrass. It's always important because you're gonna get patchy, uh, patchy looks and it's just not gonna look uniform. Fertilization is probably the biggest topic right now, um, just because of the actual expenses. Uh, the cost of fertilization is up over 300% this year. Um, last year, uh, it rose 80% due to the cargo imports, um, China and Russia exports. Um, Obviously, the, the, the cargo ports where we're uh, seeing out in you know, Los Angeles where they're backed up. The annual cost for a container of fertilizer to be shipped across the ocean was $2,500 in 2020. This year, we're crossing $25,000 per container. So obviously, that plus fuel, we're finding a substantial increase. And we're going for our customers and for, for the HOAs, I would suggest to strategize around this to reduce your costs. A, maybe reducing the amount of water we put down to reduce the amount of fertilizer you need. Um, minimize the irrigation, minimize the amount of fertilization, um, or find healthy alternatives like an organic, if you can, um, or herbicidal soaps. Um, again, those, those at, at home, if you don't want to pay the cost for a Roundup, um, I would suggest looking at uh, your Pinterest boards um, to look for like a, a vinegar solution or a herbicidal soap to try to mitigate the amount of uh, costs you might have with the Roundups or glyphosate type products. Um, healthy alternatives are always important, of course, I know because of the many issues that glyphosate has had. Um, so you may already be down that road. But I would suggest looking into it, especially around the home, because those Roundup prices, if not availability, is going to be scarce at the end of the year. Um, on the picture you're going to see here, we have uh, just a, an alert here. It says army worms. The picture on the right is going to show you some, uh, an area that's been infected by, by army worms. Um, a, 
A lot of times it's mistaken for grubs. Army worms have been making a push here over the last year, um, kind of just a, a nuisance. So there are different ways that we can detect um, and fight those off with pesticides. So before you start, um, you know, claiming that there's a grub problem, uh, there's different ways to, to, to figure out about army worms. And I would just be sure to study up on those and make sure your vendor knows about those because a lot of the times the, the two products that are used to, uh, to fight grubs or army worms, um, they need to be one or the other or dialed into a, a certain chemical to take care of both of them. Next slide there, Michael. Flowers, this one would be quick and easy and pretty, I guess. Um, so spring, spring, summer, and uh, fall flowers. The biggest thing this year is gonna be bang for your buck. Again, minimizing the, the amount of money that you have to spend um, due to the cost of gas and labor. Um, so how do we get the most bang for our buck? Spring is gonna be pretty easy. It's pansies. It's, it's one of the only flowers that does well in these colder temperatures. Summer, uh, is many, I know many people don't like to use the begonia, but using a hybrid begonia is going to reduce the amount of water you're going to need, the amount of attention that you're going to need, and a lot of the chemicals that are used uh, to keep those alive for the summer. Uh, and then fall, maybe rotating over to that cabbage and kale. Uh, a, it's gonna last longer. It's gonna give you probably October through December type coverage. Uh, instead of that six weeks that normally that pansies normally cover uh, and reduce the amount of water that's needed. So uh, just some, some tips maybe to, to maximize your efforts in reducing costs uh, and maximizing your, your, uh, your, your flower program. Okay. Next slide. I'll touch a little bit on mulching. Uh, Jonathan's gonna touch on it as well in his uh, tree and plant care. Um, the biggest thing that we see is we need to re resist the need for, for more mulch. And I know a lot of gardeners or um, at, at home um, horticulturists love to, to use that mulch. Uh, and it's because they're constantly cultivating and they do need more mulch because it's doing its job. It's breaking down and it's turning into soil. Um, but for the most part in our commercial landscapes, mulch is used as a decoration. Um, and it really needs to be thought of as a horticultural practice. We need to be mulching um, around trees and bushes to protect them from mowers and trimmers, um, but also not putting a, a, you know, an extravagant amount down. We wanna control the amount of uh, mulch that goes down so it, it breaks down and it does its job. Um, too much mulch can cause heat issues, burn out plants, cause all sorts of fungal damage or heat damage. Um, you know, the biggest one we see is it becomes basically a shield and it doesn't allow nutrients to get into the soils. Um, so cultivating is always a good, uh, good way to reduce the, co the cost of maybe mulching those beds. Um, if you do have too, mulch, too much mulch, I would suggest maybe removal and replacement making sure that you're not getting up around the crowns of a lot of those trees or bushes. Um, you can go to the next slide here, Michael. It'll give you some pictures on, on some of these practices. We wanna stay away from the volcanoes. Again, Jonathan will touch on that. You can see the second picture there in the middle kind of gives you an idea of what that shield or that cap creates after it's been weathered. You just don't get the breakdown of the mulch that you really need. And especially around this tree, you're gonna have crown damage or, or possible uh, root damages. And then A, or uh, finally, um, not putting mulch where it, where it doesn't belong. Um, we're covering paths, we're covering different areas that may be eroded. We need to figure out water issues or other environmental issues instead of covering with mulch. A, it's an annual expense that you, have, that you incur. And B, all we're doing is putting this mulch back into the river system or into the environment in which it's at and not really allowing nature to take part and do, do what it's supposed to be doing. If, if it's a water issue, we, we need to mitigate the, the water and reroute the water, um, but just not putting the mulch down um, where it doesn't belong. As far as mulch depth, uh, you wanna maintain two inches on a 
as far as a healthy environment. Um, any more, you're going to need to start cultivating on an annual basis to get that breakdown. On to pruning, um, this isn't just your normal pruning, normal pruning once or twice a year, whatever you have in your pruning programs um, is always beneficial. This is gonna be, this is discussion about dormant pruning, rejuvenation of a lot of your plants, say uh, your flowering plants, especially. Um, dormant pruning, winter pruning, um, this is going to allow your landscaper to see the branches that really need to be removed, might be rubbing, causing damage or have uh, insect or fungal disease that you can cut out of the tree, um, being visual without leaves on it or flowers or having that distraction or that obstacle to get through. Um, it's healthy for your plants, especially flowering plants like I discussed. Um, thinning them out, allowing air to move through them, reduces the amount of disease, a lot of heat, a lot of uh, humidity that's kept in them and just allows the plant to, to regenerate year after year because most of the time the flowers grow on new growth. So as we prune them back in the winter and that new growth comes out, you're going to get a lot more attractive plants. You're good there. This is another basic on it. Um, just to give you a visual, you're really just thinning it out on a dormant prune. Um, we'll cover a different type of pruning here in a second, but the dormant prune just thins it out, takes a lot of your water sprouts out, allows the plant to put energy back into its main base or uh, its main points and regenerate growth year over year. The rejuvenation or hard pruning, again, this is gonna be, uh, A, I always suggest it if you have an attractive landscape, but B, this year, especially when we're trying to reduce costs, um, this is just rejuvenating your, your overgrown plant material. Um, most of these are gonna be hardwood shrubs um, and you're gonna take them down to about 12 to 18 inches off the ground. As you can see the before and afters. And I always, always give the warning and show pictures before we do this because a lot of people are surprised on how much we do reduce uh, a plant during a rejuvenation or hard prune. Um, but this allows the plant to start over basically and, and start from the, you know, from the base of the plant growing back up. You can control it, you can, you know, prune it again after it comes back out. Um, but there are certain plants that you can do this with and most of them are hardwood shrubs. On to snow removal. Um, again, uh, we're going to face a lot of issues. We, we saw them rear the heads this year uh, in the entire city as a market. A lot of uh, a lot of vendors are either staying on their current jobs, um, meaning snow removal equipment is mostly from excavators or um, contractors that have that equipment. Landscape companies will have a lot of the equipment, but we ask for help from certain vendors or uh, partners, business partners to come in and assist in the winter, utilizing their equipment to push or remove snow. Um, with the housing market on a boom, those vendors are continuously digging and excavating properties for the home builders and continuing on with their, their annual jobs or their regular jobs. So the equipment is at a shortage right now. Um, plus to purchase equipment, you're on about a two year to three year wait list. So this practice that, that this timeline is showing is going to be ever so important for for a lot of communities this year um, because you want to get out in front of the ball game. You don't want to be late to the party um, because of the equipment, the labor, and the accessibility to snow removal equipment and supplies. This just basically describes what you want to, what you want to map out for your snow vendor selection. In the spring, you want to do your qualifications and your reviews. How did last season go? Are we looking for a change? By midsummer, you want to have that RFP out to those snow vendors um, requesting your pricing. And I would say at the latest, uh, that August timeframe for contracting on any large snow removal job. Uh, and it's, it's going to be an aggressive year. It's gonna be a competitive year as far as trying to get those vendors lined up. 
slide two here uh, on the snow removal is some, something similar. Um, basically, this is how we look at it on as a vendor. Um, what are your risks? Where are your safe zones? If you have somebody approaching you in September and October, um, you just want to have a lot of caution because that's kind of late to the ball game anymore, especially on a, a large snow removal job. Um, the green zone is, is obviously where we want to, where the, the organ, sorry, the vendors or the um, snow removal companies, subcontractors, uh, business partners want to have their contracts in place. So you know you're aligned, you know you have your equipment, and you know you have your materials in place for that fall season. Um, we've been seeing a lot of snows start coming in in October, one or two, and then having a, a dead winter as it that kind of uh, doesn't get cold enough for the snow. And then we're seeing a lot of March and April pushes. So there's not a lot of uh, occurrences here over the last five years, but at the same point in time, you wanna have those vendors in place and make sure they have the materials locked up for you. All right, question and answers. Okay. Um... I just want to give some input in regards to the slides that we have just seen. The rejuvenation pruning, that makes such a difference when you do do that. And and Aaron's right. Um, when they first do it, you think they just completely killed the bushes. Um, but when the bushes come back, it looks beautiful, fresh. And that is an amazing thing when you do that. It really does make a difference. Uh, one question I did have, Aaron, um, we have a series of questions, but one thing I thought of, the dormant prune, when do you suggest that you do that? It's really going to depend on what you're pruning. Um, most, okay. hard, mo most hardwood shrubs, you can do, I would say, around January time frame. January, February is going to be that good overlap for everything. Mm -hmm. um, depending on the plant, like I said, hydrangeas are going to be the most sensitive, and I always bring this up because they are. Um, hydrangeas, depending on when you want them to bloom and what variety or species they are, are going to fluctuate one way or the other. Okay. And we have a whole list of questions, so I'll try to get through them as quick as we can. Um, I'm going to combine two of them here. Can you speak on organic fertilizer? And then another question is why can't we get non-cargoed fertilizer? So... Non-cargo fertilizer, fertilizer um, is available for the right price. It's, it's price. 80% um, of the market is, is shipped in cargo, cargo ship fertilizer. And that's mostly the potash that's used, the salts from the mines in Russia um, and China. Canada is a large producer as well, but uh, the price is higher. Um, so... 80% of it is shipped in. Again, you're running through the ports, the fuel issues, uh, and then obviously uh, the war issues right now. China actually has shut down their cargo ships. Uh, they're only producing, they're only shipping out 20% of what they actually manufacture currently um, because of the cost of natural gas, which is used to make fertilizers or urea in the fertilizer. And they're keeping it home, keeping it in home or at in, in country for their own agricultural use. So those are kind of the the, the summary uh, topics of why uh, we can't get it in here in, in, as far as the United States fertilizer. It's a cost issue and a manufacturing issue. Okay, um, and Jonathan, you may uh, want to answer some of these questions because uh, the next one is: Are blue spruce are not well, we are told it's a fungus and nothing can be done. What plantings could replace them quickly and economically? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? I was muted. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so there's a disease called needle cast that affects blue spruces. Um, it can be treated, but it's something you spray to treat. Uh, I'll cover a little bit more later, but it you treat as a preventative to cover the new growth. Um, I, I recommend a lot of Removing it though, if it's not you know a, a prize Bruce and replacing with a uh, green giant arb because they get established quick and grow a little bit quicker and um, don't have as much issues. So, that's okay, typically what I recommend. 
All right, and Aaron, uh, for spring and fall, what type of flowers do you recommend? I, I have personal issues with pansies, but pansies, I'm just not a fan, but that's the best thing you can plant in spring and fall for temperatures. Well, spring, fall, pansies, cabbage, kale. That's what I would stick with. I like the cabbage and kale because it, it, you get more time out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is, it is attractive once it starts blooming uh, in those later months. Okay. Um, I'm not going to be able to say this word right, so I'll spell it. But our Norway spruce has P-H-O-M-O-P. Oh, phom phomopsis. Thank you. So yeah. I know we need to spray in the spring. <laughs> what is the right time in Indianapolis to spray? So phomopsis is a disease that's spread through, um, you know, it's a canker on twigs. It causes like tip dieback. Um, so you could do a systemic anytime in the spring right now, but if you're doing a full air application, you want to do it when the candles um, grow to about two inches um, and when temperatures stay typically around 60, 70, um, even 50s, sometimes the disease can spread. So um, then you continue spraying throughout that window to uh, until we get to summer when it's a little bit drier and these diseases aren't spreading as much. Okay, and then Jonathan, are emerald yep. ash borer treatments still recommended now every two years using the Arbor Jet injection treatments? Yep, we're still doing every two years. It's what the label says. Um, Purdue has done some studies showing that, you know, three years you get control, but a lot of people have spent, you know, 10 years worth of injections and I would hate to just take that risk and go against the label to, you know, save a couple hundred bucks. Um, so we still do at two years and that's what we recommend. Okay. Um, Aaron, recommendations on aeration. Yes, do it. Um, that's the answer. Yes, you're in a heavy clay, no matter where you're at and especially in uh, most HOAs, you're has been stripped away, sold for uh, top dollar, and you're sitting on a pile of clay. Aerate, aerate, aerate. Just it, um, sorry to cut in. It also cuts down on that fertilizer use. So if you aerate more, it dethatches, decompacts, and then you uh, have to use less water. You use less fertilizer. Um, and just all around, it's it's good. Sorry to cut in there. You're fine. It's perfect. Um, Aaron, is it too late now to do rejuvenation pruning if we, if they do it now? Uh, yeah, you're on your spring buds, uh, for Cynthia's blooming, your, your cherries are out, magnolias are out for the most part. Yeah. Your bud. Yeah. You don't want to do that now. Okay. Liquid or granulated fertilizer. What do you think is best? Oh, depends on, the, depends on your application. Uh, early on this time of year, you want a liquid. Um, for weed control, other issues, um, but it's a mix. So you're, you're putting both down right now, kind of. Um, if you're going organic, uh, I would say uh, probably the granular is better because it's a little bit slower release. But if you're trying to get, get rid of weeds, if it's a weed control issue, you want to go with the, uh, with the liquid. Okay. Um, how large will green giant arborvitae get based on the density? Uh, well, so a green giant will typically get, I mean, they can get to 50, 60 foot. Um, once established, they grow three, like three feet a year, I believe. Um, and they, they stay a, a pretty shape. So they grow pretty quick. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to stop here, Michael. We're going to go on to the next. I understand there's more questions, and I'll pick it back up where Richard had a question, and we'll just keep it going for right now. Okay, great. Thank you, Leo. <clears throat> All right, we'll have Jonathan uh, talk about trees now. Yeah, we dipped into it a little bit. Um, so I'm, I'm Jonathan Wynn. I'm a certified arborist. Uh, I work at BAM Outdoor, where I'm account manager for some of our commercial properties. Uh, I've been an arborist for five years now. I've um, done plant health care for the last eight. And then I've been spraying, you know, I've done lawn care and tree care for probably the last 12 years or so. Um, 
So what we're going to cover is proper way to plant a tree, and then we're going to go more into mulching proper techniques, um, and then what you should prune out of your young trees and what you should look for, as well as uh, what happens when you over mulch and how we can resolve that with root color excavations. And then um, go over some of our standard plant health care treatments, our standard schedule for when we spray things throughout the season, and common issues that we get calls on with confusion. And um, another thing, uh, iron deficiency is something that we see a lot of. And then uh, plant growth regulators on um, how we can control growth and, and we'll get more into that. So, perfect. So we'll start with tree planting. We always wanna make sure we, we pick the right tree in the right location. You know, we wanna make sure that the tree we pick isn't gonna grow um, up into power lines. Um, we don't want it to be too wide where it's grown into streets and um, where we have to prune it and whack it way back. You know, a lot of these new developments, they're putting trees two feet off of houses. Um, and then we have to come back and really do some heavy pruning to, to keep them off. Um, so once we have the right tree, we're going to want to find the site, make sure it's, it's good, properly drained. Um, we're going to dig the hole, you know, two, two size, the, the ball size, and make sure there's plenty of loose so um, soil. If you do it just the ball size, you'll get some compaction on the walls and roots won't be able to break through and have trouble getting out. Um, if you're worried about drainage, you can always fill the hole up with water and see how long it drains. Um, not something I typically do. Um, usually you can tell from the, the surface how good the soil is. Um, you wanna prune any dead and, and remove anything that might uh, be unsightly during transportation. Uh, things get broken sometimes because the way these get packed down. Um, put the tree in slightly above grade where the root color is exposed. Uh, you don't want to dig the hole too deep because if you do, the tree can settle over time and then that leads to uh, too much soil and, and over mulching. Uh, if it's a bald and, bald and burlapped tree, you want to pull the cage back, remove. Uh, I like to remove all the cage. Um, they recommend at least half. Uh, cut all the twine, remove the burlap off the top of it. And a lot of times you got to remove even six inches of soil that's on top of the ball. Um, just from the process of them wrapping it, it, it covers it up. And then you start some of this root girdling issue because you have too much soil. And then you over mulch on top of that already buried too deep tree. So digging and removing some of that will help you uncover that. Uh, if it's a container tree, a lot of those roots will grow in circles. So you want to remove the container, cut all the roots, kind of shave down the sides. Um, make sure all the roots are growing out because, again, you don't want circling roots. It could eventually uh, choke the tree out and kill it. Um, remove any twine or anything that might be tied around it. And then you're going to use the soil that you dug out of the hole to put back in. You don't want to do amendments because amendments kind of create an environment for the, the tree to, you know, roots are lazy. So if you have good soil right around the tree, they're not going to grow out and they're not going to go adventuring to try to find better soil and, and, and establish more. They're going to stay in that hole. So using the same soil that you have will be the best for the tree. Um, and if the tree is in a windy area, spruces especially, you'll want to stake them because they can blow over and you don't want to go back and re reset your tree, especially if you're planting a bunch. Typically, I don't like to stake trees because it doesn't allow them to really grow and, and a tree needs to blow in the wind and, and figure out how it's going to establish those roots to hold itself up. So if you have these stakes on there holding this tree up for several years, the tree won't develop the roots it needs and eventually could fail whenever you take those off. Also, if you don't remove the stakes, uh, like a lot of these restaurants, they uh, girdle the tops of the tree and you'll see the, the top of the tree dead laying next to the tree where they never removed the, the twine. So, and then a new tree, once it's, um, sorry, once it's, planted, you'll probably want to water it five to 10 gallons a week. And that's when temperatures are, you know, warm, 70, 80 degrees and warmer. 
And you'll want to do this for at least two years, but sometimes up to five. Our, our soil, again, isn't very good. And you want to make sure it gets watered nice and deep. We get a lot of you know, light rains that only waters the surface, and that will lead to some surface roots that you see sometimes um, just because shallow watering and, and compaction. So no. next slide. So moving on, once you get your tree planted, these are typical things that you're going to want to look for. Um, you're going to want to remove any, you know, squirrely looking branches, anything that's crossing or growing back, water sprouts, suckers. And those are just um, growth that's quick growing branches that's going straight up just so the tree can get photosynthesis, uh, damage branches from transportation, uh, girdling roots. You, if you see those right away, remove them. Um, co-dominant, you know, we plant a lot of maples and they are very co-dominant. And if you let those go over time, they'll create a, a inclusion in the bark and that never properly heals. And then we get ice or wind and that that's going to fail and, and topple right over. Okay. Next one. So on to mulching. So we want to put about two to four inches of mulch and we want to go to the drip line if possible. Um, I'm not a fan of turf. So I say, if you can mulch your whole yard, do it because trees need it more than the turf does. Um, keeping the root flare exposed, you can see in the photo on the left, that was a tree that um, was over mulched that we corrected. Um, it was about eight to 10 inches over mulched. And you can kind of see that flare on the tree. Um, you can see the nice buttress roots flaring out. And that's what you want to keep exposed. Um, so mulching maintains the soil moisture, protects from mechanical damages, from mowers, weed eaters, um, from your lawn guys getting in a big hurry. Uh, insulates the soil, keeps it warmer, or keeps it warmer in winter and cooler in summer. Uh, a, a thick layer will help control weeds. It eventually breaks down and helps soil structure. Um, and a properly mulched tree, of course, looks great. Uh, improper mulching can lead to trapping moisture against the trunk, uh, creating a home for rodents so they can chew on the roots and cause uh, trunk and bark damage, and creates a kind of a pocket because trees, you know, like I said, are lazy. They want to grow the roots where it's easy. And if you start building this organic matter up on the roots, it's typically just going to grow in that circle and, and stay established in that area. So, um, and sometimes too with mounds, if you mound it up, you know, water moves lateral in the ground. And that kind of, you know, causes a, a wash away of mulch and you want to keep the, the roots watered properly. Next one. All right. So say your tree's been over mulched and it's been that way for a long time. Um, that root collar we pointed out, we always want to keep it exposed. So when it's mulched, you'll see a, a fine growth of fibrous roots that will start to grow around the trunk and, and, um, in many cases, I've seen completely kill trees where they just fall over just because they've been choked for their whole life and never been properly corrected. So there's a technique using a compressor and subsonic air to blast the soil away gently, not to damage any of the, the structural roots, but you take your time and, and blow out the soil and, and cut these roots um, away from the trunk and have a good structure you can typically do about 20% of root pr pruning based on the diameter. Um, so it's a good amount of roots and you typically wanna do this um, either in the spring or later in the season where you're not stressing the tree out for water use. Um, and it just give the tree a better time to heal those wounds without just being stressed the whole season. All right, next one. So here's an example of another one. This, this red maple was, the owner said he planted it and it was 25 years old. Um, and it's been improperly planted or mulched its whole life. And as you can tell, those are all those fibrous roots I was talking about being lazy, just hanging out in the mulch. Um, so we came in here and you can also tell by the leaves that the tree is stressed because it has some chlorosis going on. And um, it just is not a happy tree. So we came in, blasted away a layer of soil and, and, and mulch. And with this being so bad, we had to uh, do it in many steps. So this was the first, I think, blow. And then the next slide here, 
is the the next round. So we removed quite a bit of, of just fine roots. Um, and even it's hard to see from the photo, but there's still quite a bit of girdling roots in this tree. And when trees get so bad, you can only do so much every year. So typically you stop and then you can come back and, and readdress the tree um, based on the health of what it's looking like and whether or not you should cut more. Um, and to me, I think this is a better, a, a good investment than removing the tree and starting over because trees are expensive and take a long time to grow. I mean, this tree was 25 years old, be it that it, it should be a lot larger, but um, there's a lot of money and time invested in this tree. And I'd hate to just come in and remove it just because of a, a little issue like this that can be corrected. All right, next one. So here's the, the final photo. You know, we extended the mulch bed um, level with grade, how mulch should look, not mounded up. You sh it should be flat on the surface around the roots because we're, you know, mulching the roots. We don't really mulch the trunk. We want to keep that moisture where the tree is uptaking it for photosynthesis. All right, next one. So here's another example. Um, I got called out in the spring and the homeowner said, my maple is, you know, having a lot of leaf disease, it has scale issues, it's, it just looks terrible, it's not growing, it's not vigorous. Uh, you can see by the, the inner nodes that it's not really growing. And I'm like, well, you know, we have about 12 inches here of, of soil that, that shouldn't be here. Uh, I took the blocks away and then took the photo. I should have left them, but um, you can see they had a, a little bed created, a, a tree casket, like I like to call it, placed around the tree here and then over time, they just mulched and mulched and mulched, um, thinking it looked good. You know, it probably did. Um, well, not with red mulch, because I'm not a fan of that. But um, you can see the finished photo there, that flare that you want to see on your trees. Next one. So now I'm going to jump into plant health care and when we do some of our services. Uh, so in the spring, like right now, we're starting with our dormant oils. We're getting into spring fertilizations, which typically have a, a liquid deep root with high nitrogen to promote some growth. Um, we're doing some bed fertilizations with um, a slow release, triple 14, a complete fertilizer. And here in probably a week or two, we'll start spraying crab apples or apple scab. Um, it's a disease that causes, you know, crab apples to drop their leaves middle of the season. Um, Typically when it warms up because it blocks photosynthesis and trees drop leaves that aren't helping. Um, maples for anthracnose, sycamores the last two or three years, if you notice in June or July, they don't have, well, June, they don't have leaves. Um, they get really bad anthracnose in the spring and that causes them to drop the leaves. The last couple of years, they've gotten it a couple of times. Um, we'll start spraying spruces in about May. Um, summer, we continue into some of the spruce fungicides. We'll be finishing up depending on the weather. If it's warming up, then we can cut those out and we'll start seeing bagworms and mite action and Japanese beetles. We'll still do some fertilizations, but a lower nitrogen and more biostimulants um, just to, you know, get some aeration in the soil and, and some organic treatments, scale treatments. When they are active, we'll want to spray them. Um, we start ash injections when leaves are fully emerged for the best uptake. Um, we continue all those through summer and in the fall, we'll continue doing miticides. Um, magnolia and tulip scale is active in the fall and that's the only time you can treat for that. Um, and then we do iron injections because it's such a higher rate. Winter, we do anti-desiccants, which is a protection that you spray on evergreens that um, stops transfer transpiration and wind damage. Um, we don't water spruces in the winter. Uh, we should, if we have a, a dry winter and we're not getting much rain or snow, um, but trees still transpire throughout the year. So if we don't put anti-transparent, that wind can cause their stomata to open and, and breathe and release water. And then if we don't protect that, they can get winter burn. And that's when you see that brown tip that, that happens sometimes on arbs and spruces. So now we'll go into some common issues that I get called in for all the time. We get calls saying they have bagworms. Um, and a lot of times people see these, the Eastern tent caterpillar photo there, and that's what they call bagworm. So I go out and I'm looking for the little bag on the left. Um, 
we treat for these, the, the actual bagworms, we treat for these starting in into May, early June, when they at, they hatch each bag can hold up to a thousand plus eggs. So if you don't get on this early, you can have an infestation and see trees by June and July, just completely eaten and destroyed. Um, by the end of the season, when you see these two inch bags, it's too late to spray for them, but you can pull them off with your hands and trash them, throw them in a bucket of water and dispose of them. If you throw them on the ground, they could eventually hatch and, and re-infest. Um, Eastern tent caterpillars, they hatch in the spring, start feeding on foliage, and then they create these um, big old webs, usually in, in crab apples and hawthorns. I see it a lot. Uh, a lot of people say, just take the torch to it and, and burn them. You know, don't do that. It's bad for your tree. Uh, you can physically remove it, or you can use a bio-rational insecticide not to kill beneficials to treat it. Um, but just don't burn your tree down or light a fire that close to your house. All right, next one. So easily confused with the Eastern tent caterpillar is mimosa webworm on honey locusts. We saw this really bad last year. Uh, it, it only affects honey locust trees. Uh, you can do full air applications, but typically I don't recommend it just because of um, killing beneficial insects and causing other insect problems by doing that. And um, we try to do as little as we can to the environment and systemics typically is the best for this. These will have a generation midsummer and they'll start to feed. You won't really see the damage until August or September sometimes. And then that's when you start seeing these brown tips on the honey locusts. If a tree is healthy, typically this will just um, cause kind of a, a, an ugly looking tree. And, and if the tree is good in the following year, it'll grow out of it and be good. It just might not be as vigorous or grow as fast as it should be. Um, cold, and if we don't have um, as cold a winter, we don't get as much dieback. So the last two or three years, we've seen a, a heavy surplus of these. So next is the spruce needle cast, probably one of the, the biggest calls we get. Um, so spruces get this disease that starts, you know, affects the lower branches and inside and works its way up. Uh, you can treat it. These trees here, I would probably not recommend treatment. Uh, we are treating some that have bounced back. Um, but since you're treating the new growth stuff that's already dropped, it's needles cannot be saved. So once it's dead, it's dead. So you typically start spraying when the needle growth gets two to three inches and then you protect the new growth and over, you know, three to five years, you'll start seeing a bounce back, um, making sure the root color is exposed, making sure the tree is getting watered, um, fertilization and biostimulant can, can help with soil, um, or just removing and switching to a resistant variety, um, Norway spruce, white spruce, black hills, uh, they're all a good resistant variety. Or, um, you know, spruces are not native to our climate so they don't really like growing here and you know their lifetime span is probably 25 to 30 years anyways and they'll start declining after that so i'm, I'm not a big fan of them um, they keep us busy but um, they just are a lot of nuisance a lot of issues they also have mites and bagworms they get um, cytospora which is a canker on the trunk they can get pine weevil damage which kills the top they get all kinds of stuff um, but typically you'll see some black specks on your needles they'll they'll turn purple on some varieties and um, you know starting probably here in a month we'll start treating these and hopefully seeing some good resistance another one we see is uh, iron deficiency in river birches and pin oaks we have heavy clay soils with a high pH of eight and a half. And these trees typically like to be in a low pH of six to six and a half when iron is available. Whenever the pH is that high, it just gets locked up in the soil and that iron cannot be taken up into the tree. So um, changing your soil pH can help with this. Um, we also see girdling roots and insects and droughts damage cause this decline. Um, and sometimes even iron deficiency and manganese deficiency down on the right. You'll see that on a lot of red maples. Um, it's a similar to iron, you know, it gets locked up in the soil. 
Uh, you can treat these with a trunk injection. That's usually the best way that I've seen be effective. Um, with lower cases, you can do fertilization in the soil and doing a sulfur treatment in the soil can lower the pH. Um, and a growth regulator treatment can also be beneficial in this. So one of the treatments for the iron injection is a macro injection. It's a high volume um, injection that puts a, a high volume of water and uh, iron into the tree. Later in the fall, you can do a higher volume of it or a higher um, dose. Uh, it works in pin oaks and river birch and red maples typically is all we, we treat. And you wanna dig down, expose that root flare and you put a lot of these ports in the tree and that way it's an even distribution throughout the tree. A micro injection is um, less ports but more liquid and it, it can not spread evenly. So these macro injections spread evenly. And um, these are done late in the fall. So you don't risk burning any leaves or knocking stuff off with too high of a dose. All right, next one. And then last, we do a lot of plant growth regulators with our um, urban trees. Uh, they're just always planted in very bad spots. You know, even these trees are planted right in medians. And a plant growth regulator can slow down growth and increase that fine root growth to help with uptake of nutrients. Um, it slows down its need for water and fertilizer. It makes the leaves thicker so that chlorophyll production is increased and it gives you a nice darker green look. And this can help with the iron efficiency as well, just because it, the tree doesn't need as much nutrients to be pushing that new growth. Um, just, it, it's a, a very good benefit. It lasts for up to three years. And as you can see in the photo there, it, it can control the growth by up to 60% a year. So if you do ornamentals and, and reductions, you can control that growth and keep it looking pruned without having to come back and make lots of cuts every year to keep it controlled. So, perfect. Okay. Yep. Um We'll go to some questions and uh, young arborvitae trees appear to be stressed at this time in our area, a lot of brown. Any suggestions on that? Um, well, if they're young and new, if they're not um, watered throughout the season, uh, it could be winter burn because like I said, we do an anti-transparent on these to protect their cells so they're not getting water loss throughout the winter. So, um, and a nice warm winter, you want to water your tree at least once a month with a good soaking. Um, and sometimes here in the spring and, and even in the fall, you'll see some needle drop. Just it's normal. So just taking a look and seeing uh, what, what's a normal drop and what's normal, uh, not normal. If it's on the west side, it could be just a, a high wind burn from winter winds. Okay. Um, another question, is there any way to prevent crab apple trees from producing fruit? There is, yeah. There's an anti-fruit spray called Florel that you can spray on crab apples, uh, pear trees, sweet gums, black walnuts, um, almost anything that's fruit producing that is a nuisance. Uh, there's also a trunk injection that you can do as well. I've had some luck with that, but the, the Florel application... You spray it when the tree is flowering to sterilize the flowers. That way, fruit is not produced. So it has to be timed perfectly to get that get those good results. Okay. Could large burning bush plants be cheaper alternative to green giant? Uh, I never re recommend burning bushes. They're highly invasive. Um, I, I would just remove all burning bushes if I could. Um, and compared to an evergreen. I would probably go with more like a viburnum, a leatherleaf viburnum is a semi evergreen. It can hold its leaves uh, throughout the winter, give you privacy. It grows up to 20, 30 foot and will do a lot better and, and is not invasive like the burning bush. Okay. Um, just so the audience knows, at the very last screen, we'll have all of the speakers' contact information up. So if there's something you want to email them, a direct question, we'll be having that information at the very end. 
Uh, the last question before we move on, will green emerald arborvitae survive in most soil types under varying soil moisture conditions? And where would you definitely not plant them? They, uh, they don't like to be wet, so they don't want to be in a low-lying area. So as long as they're in a good, well-drained soil, they'll be fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, and thanks to Aaron for answering some of those questions that we had earlier. And um, Jonathan, if you can just look, we have some questions at the very end that you, if you could try to answer those so we can keep moving on. Yeah, um, definitely. Sorry if okay. I went a little long. No, Maybe. you're fine. Yeah. Um, can <laughs> yeah. you just repeat one more time uh, what to use on the crab apples so they do not lose leaves in summer? Uh, so it's just a fungicide application. You do a, a fungal treatment starting now, um, three applications, typically that goes until May, and then they're, they're in the safe, safe window there. Okay. And you just need to look at the question about how about growth regulator and yep. move on yep. from there. Perfect. So we, we saved the best for last here, Kevin from uh, ASAP. Um, I've worked with Kevin for many, many years. So you do a great job regarding ponds and I'll let you take the, the next section. All right, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kevin McLaughlin. I'm a senior account manager uh, with ASAP Aquatics. Uh, we've been around since 1996. Um, this is my 17th season going in. Uh, first two were in the field and the last 15, uh, I have been an account manager with them. Uh, first thing I want to talk about is uh, you know, retention pond. What is a retention pond? Because there's there's a lot of misconceptions uh, on what it, it, it truly is. So uh, a retention pond, uh, it's a body of water that's designed to uh, manage stormwater runoff to prevent flooding and downstream uh, erosion and improve water quality in adjacent rivers and streams. So it, it what its purpose is really is to... Um, filter out heavy pollutants before they make their way into a natural waterway. So um, unfortunately, uh, they are designed uh, to be pretty nasty. I mean, they get nutrients and organic matter uh, entering the pond through runoff, uh, contain fertilizers, fertilizers, animal waste, uh, grass clippings, uh, stuff from the streets, oil, gas, uh, which you can see in this picture. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that, that make their way into a retention pond um, that are, you know, not uh, enjoyable <laughs> by any means, um, but that's their purpose. That's what they are, are, are designed to do. Uh, you know, neighborhoods put them in for flooding, um, but, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, only the people that live on the retention pond, you know, affect it, um, which is incorrect. All the, the drains in the streets throughout the entire neighborhood uh, eventually make their way into those retention ponds. So, uh, you know, if you have animals or whatever in your backyard or fertilizers or things like that, you know, some of that's going to make their way into that retention pond as well. So it's, it's not just the people that live on, on the retention pond that affect it. Um, you know, algae 101, uh, you know, that's the most common thing that, that people ask about, uh, you know, slime, uh, you know, green slime, algae, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, it's just an, an informal term for a large and diverse group of uh, photosynthetic organisms. You know, algae is a very simple plant. It's been around forever. Uh, you know, we always say it was around when the dinosaurs were here. So, it's found ways to adapt and continue to grow and continue to thrive. So, uh, you know, it's something that's always going to be around. Um, algae will grow as long as nutrients and sunlight are sufficient. A lot of times, you know, we've seen uh, yards uh, in my own yard, I've seen where puddles can uh, form. And then if, you know, conditions are right, you'll start to see some algae growing in a puddle. Um, you know, so let alone in a retention pond, you know, that's full of those nutrients. Uh, and then the sunlight penetration, you know, a lot of times, you know, people will say, you know, how come I get algae around the shoreline all the time, but I don't really see it out in the middle. And the reason for that is when retention ponds are built, um, they are 
designed with a safety ledge around the shoreline. Uh, that safety ledge is designed so that uh, if an animal, a small child, uh, whatever it may be goes, uh, gets into the pond, they don't instantly go into uh, deep water. Um, there's that safety ledge for them to kind of collect themselves or somebody to help them. Well, because of that, you know, a lot of the nutrients find their way right into that area, but also you get the sunlight penetration that goes straight to the bottom. So, you know, if you have a pond that's, you know, eight, 10 feet deep in the middle, that sunlight's not going to make it to the bottom, uh, you know, to make heavy growth in that area. Whereas if you have a pond, you know, that safety ledge is usually few inches to maybe a foot deep up to, you know, 15, 20 feet out. So uh, it's very easy for algae to grow in those areas uh, and regenerate. You know, the biggest thing that, the easiest way for us to, you know, relay it to clients is to take it more to the landscaping side. You know, just as if you have somebody regularly mowing your grass, you know, it grows back, you mow it again. It's the same thing with, you know, algae, uh, algae and ponds. You know, we can't just come out, make one treatment, and you're good for the year. You know, it's a continual process. So, you know, we run, you know, weekly programs where we're out there on a regular basis uh, to check for algae and weed growth because, you know, obviously we want to make it as attractive as possible for the homeowners. So we want to keep that, that algae and weed growth as minimal as possible. Uh, you know, we'll, uh, you know, bluntly tell you, you're probably... Uh, going to see some algae growth in between our visits. Uh, you know, that's just something that's going to happen uh, because of how, you know, quickly it can regenerate. So um, it's not uncommon to see it in between visits, but obviously, you know, the management of it, we want to keep it as minimal as possible for everybody so that, you know, that pond is aesthetically pleasing uh, as it can be. Uh, submersed weeds, these are weeds that grow uh, from the uh, soil and the sediment in the pond. Uh, they never break the water surface tension. So, you know, our base program uh, is, you know, green algae and submersed weeds. You know, those are the two most common things that you're going to see in a pond. Uh, you know, submersed plants, they depend on the water for support and stabilization. So, you know, they're going to grow right there. They're most likely, same thing, you know, along with the algae, you're most likely going to see them uh, right around the shorelines because, you know, that's where it's shallow. That's where the sunlight penetration is. That's where most of the nutrients are going to be sitting. Uh, you know, it's, there's many different uh, pond weeds that can come up. There's different stages in the season of when we'll make those treatments. Uh, there's some typical spring pond weeds. You'll have a few in the summer. Uh, and then some in the fall. So, you know, there's some ponds where, you know, as we're in algae, you know, we're treating that basically on a consistent basis throughout the season. You know, most of the time when it comes to weed treatments, you know, we're doing, you know, one, two, three, uh, depending on how much, you know, growth you have in the pond throughout the, throughout the season. Uh, immersed uh, weeds or immersed plants. Uh, cattails, lily pads, uh, bulrush, needle rush, arrowhead, um, primrose, unfortunately. Um, you know, these are plants that grow along the, the shoreline of the ponds, but they are immersed. They, they break the water surface tension, so they can grow out of the water. You know, their stems are in the water um, to collect that uh, for root growth and stabilization, but you know, cattails, those things can get, you know, eight, 10 feet tall. So, uh, you know, these are things that, that we can spray. There's a different method uh, of spraying these. We usually use a backpack or a land-based, uh, what we call a gator. Uh, we have a spray system on that. With these um, chemicals, um, they can be, they target uh, photosynthesis production. So a lot of these, you know, the biggest thing that we come across with these is that they can be detrimental to grass. So what we wanna do with these is we want to spray from land to the pond so that any overspray uh, goes into the water. Uh, I mean, these all the chemicals that we use are EPA regulated, designed for aquatic use, designed to break down. So uh, any of that overspray we want going into the pond so that the grass isn't harmed. Most of the algicides, um, you know, that, that those chemicals, the algicides aren't going to affect grass. 
Um, some of the herbicides for submersed weeds can, um, but not very many. Um, you know, most of the time, the immersed plants are the ones that we have to be careful with and make sure that we spray differently um, so that we're not harming the grass. So here's just a couple pictures uh, showing the different treatments. You know, on the left here, you can obviously see the, you know, we are spraying the algae. Um, alga cells, uh, individual cells, even though you can see these mats forming, uh, those are just millions of uh, alga cells uh, meshed together. So when we're spraying, you can see, you know, a lot of people say, hey, I saw you out spraying. You know, it looks like you're spraying a fire hose out there. And that's it, you know, we have spray systems on there so that when we're spraying the pond, you know, that force of that water is coming out to try and break up those mats, break up those trapped gases that are keeping it at the surface so that the chemical can get into all those alga cells uh, and kill those off. The breakdown uh, of algae is usually about two to four days, depending on how much is there. Um, in some circumstances, you know, if it was bad, you know, we can make a treatment and there could even be a little bit of residual the, the following uh, week when we're there. We'll get in, treat it, break it up again, and hopefully, you know, it'll clear it up a little bit. When it comes to algae, uh, we are getting ready to start the season. Our contracts pick up April 1st uh, after water temperatures are greater than 60 degrees. Uh, the greater than 60 degrees is the chemical label. Uh, the quickest and easiest way I can uh, translate that is EPA has very strict regulations on aquatic chemicals because they are going into water. They are designed to break down extremely quickly. Uh, when we come in and make an algae treatment, that product's only active in the water for an hour, hour and a half, and then it breaks down and becomes in or inactive. So, uh, you know, they're designed to break down extremely quickly. If the water temperature is below that 60 degree uh, threshold, the metabolism of the alga cells isn't working fast enough to take in that product before it breaks down. So when the water temperatures are too cold, you can come in and make a treatment and you can see zero results from it uh, or very little results from it. Uh, once the water you know, hits that 60 degree mark, then you start seeing effective treatments. You know, obviously once the water warms up in the summer, you know, the breakdown happens a lot faster. So um, it really is, you know, water temperature is very key uh, to effective treatments or non-effective treatments when it comes to pond care. Submersed weeds, uh, those take a little, uh, a little bit longer to break down, you know, roughly seven to 14 days um, on when, you know, those are actually gonna break down. It's more of a systemic, um, you know, the algae, the alga cells, like I said, they're individual cells, uh, submersed weeds, it's systemic, it's gonna work its way down through the plant into the root system. So that's gonna take a little bit longer for breakdown. On the immersed side, uh, you know, some of the cattails um, and lilies and, um, you know, uh, arrowhead and things like that, they can take longer uh, because it's also systemic. It's working its way, especially cattails. You know, those can get eight to 10 feet tall. So it's working its way down through the cattail. Uh, it's going to take a little while. Now you can start to see them probably browning out, you know, in a few weeks. But, uh, you know, we always tell people don't do any type of removal or cut down. Uh, at least until 45 to 60 days because we want to make sure that that product has had, you know, the full time to work its way down into the root system. Uh, one thing I will say with, uh, you know, immersed plants, specifically cattails, cattails are like a dandelion on land. So, you know, they get those seed heads at the top, those seeds blow all over. Um, so you can treat the cattails. We can spray the physical cattail that's there but there could be some seeds from those cattails down in the, the soil and the sediment that we can't do anything about until it actually grows. So, you know, it can take multiple seasons uh, for treatments uh, to get control of, of cattails. Uh, primrose, that's an invasive plant. Uh, it's a green vine, grows along the shoreline, gets yellow uh, flowers on it. That's an invasive plant. We strongly recommend treating that. Um, that can grow very quickly. It's a South American plant, so in the, the heart of the summer, when it's very dry and warm, 
that plant can grow extremely quickly. So, uh, you know, we have programs uh, designed for those uh, as well to take care of them. So this is just a little video um, showing, you know, how a pond can be, or, or this is actually a Geis Reservoir section, can be extremely bad. Uh, and then, you know, within, you know, eight days or so post-treatment, uh, it can look completely different. And this is just, you know, there was so thick that, you know, the, the breakdown wasn't the two to the four day normal. Uh, like I said, this is, uh, <laughs> this is something that took a little bit longer to break down. And it might even be hard to see, but there is a little bit residual in there. Uh, that we still had to come back and, and clear up. Uh, launching, you know, so, you know, our spray systems are built into the boats. You know, people ask us, well, you know, can't you just carry a boat down there or can't you just spray from shore? Well, well we can't carry a boat. Uh, the boats with the spray systems are pretty heavy uh, and treatments from shore uh, are just really aren't effective. You know, as I mentioned, you know, we have the high pressure systems built into the boats because it's it's the most effective way to treat and clear up that vegetation. There's basically two different types of launches. There's a common launch. Um, if you see around the pond, it's a common area, you know, owned by the neighborhood. There's no houses right there. Uh, you know, we can back down, launch into the, into the pond. There's some that are completely surrounded by houses. We actually have to go between two houses to get back to the pond. You know, it may be an easement to get back to the pond. It may just be that there was no other option and those homeowners are allowing us to do that because they want to, you know, keep their pond clean. So those are the two things. We use Jeeps now um, to launch our boats. Um, they seem to be, you know, a lot more effective. We used to use some bigger trucks. So, you know, one thing that whether it's the common launch or whether it's, you know, somebody's yard, uh, you know, the one thing that we run into, particularly in the spring, is, you know, wet turf, uh, you know, so the last thing that, that we want to do, and I'll be honest, every year we have a few of these, but the last thing that we want to do is come in and, and tear up somebody's yard. Um, we'll cover, obviously, the repair of it, but, you know, so obviously that's something that we don't want to have to mess with. It's going to take time to make that repair. It's going to take money to make that repair. So there's sometimes that we just have to say, hey, it was too wet. We can't get in and we'll have to try and come back another time. Um, but, you know, that's something that you know, we have to encounter throughout the entire year. Uh, but mainly in the spring uh, that can come up and, you know, it, it stinks for us because, you know, we know a pond, you know, has been getting nutrients all winter. The spring sunlight comes out, starts to warm up, things like to start growing, you know, so the, the spring is, is always the, the busiest time for us. Uh, and we're, every spring we're behind the, you know, the eight ball because, you know, it comes back to the uh, water temperature. You know, we have people, we've had people calling us for two or three weeks now because we've had a few warm days and they got algae on their ponds. Unfortunately, there's nothing that we can do right now, um, you know, we have a pond in front of our building. We took the temperature the other day, the water temperature was 35 degrees. So, I mean, it's, it's not even anywhere close to being able to make an effective treatment yet. Yet we know that ponds have algae on them. It's unsightly. It's only gonna get worse before it gets better. Um, the one thing that I always tell people though is that the beauty of you know, spring algae uh, is that it's very thin. It's not very dense. It's very easy to, to treat and clear up. It's not that thick algae that you can get in the summer. So that's the one saving grace. Once we're able to get started and get trading, uh, we can clear it up rather easily and get rolling on the program. A uh, couple things about fish. Uh, you know, there's some basic, a lot of the fish uh, in the ponds, you know, we've had people tell us, ah, there's no fish in the pond. Every pond has fish in it. They get in it. Um, these ponds, all these ponds are connected through an underwater tile system. So, you know, your neighborhood pond might be connected to another neighborhood's, uh, another neighborhood's coming into yours before they eventually end up in that river, stream, or creek. So, you know, fish can make their way through the culvert pipes uh, during, you know, heavy rains and things like that. People stock them. 
uh, people catch and, and put fish into their own ponds. So uh, there are many different types of fish, you know, bass, bluegill, uh, catfish, crappie. Those are the, uh, the main, you know, kind of sport fish that we see uh, in these ponds. Um, the, the one thing that I will say is that, you know, everybody asks us, well, can we stock this? Uh, can we fish? Can we eat it? Um, you know, we need to get more fish in there. Well, that's fine. Um, but we need to remember when we go back to what a retention pond truly is, these things are not built or uh, designed to sustain fish life. So although we know that they all have fish in them, you know, that's not what their key purpose is. So, uh, you know, you have to be careful. You know, a lot of these fish reproduce quickly. Um, you know, you're going to have uh, uh, an overflow of fish in the pond that the pond definitely can't sustain. Uh, and so you just have to be very careful with that. Um, shad and grass carp, a lot of people will ask us about, hey, can we put grass carp in the pond? Sure, you can. Uh, we do not recommend it uh, for a couple different reasons. Uh, one reason being um, copper-based products are what are used to treat uh, algae, whether it's, you know, liquid version, uh, or a copper or a crystal version, um, you know, that is what the main product is used to treat algae. Grass carp and koi are very susceptible to copper-based products. So uh, you can put them in there. They don't do anything for algae except help, help it grow. They have a short digestive tract. Um, they are own, uh, only uh, intended to eat some of the submersed weeds, hence the name grass carp. Uh, nothing about algae. So um, you know, they don't help with algae, uh, they help with weeds, but you're, you're hiring us to help maintain those weeds as well. So, um, you know, why put them at risk, you know, just treating the basic normal algae, the most thing that you're going to treat for uh, throughout the season um, that they can be susceptible to. Uh, the one uh, fish that drives us crazy um, is the shad. Uh, shad is basically a bait fish um, for the sport fish. They're put in, you know, small uh, finger lengths. Well, shad can grow very fast. Uh, once they get bigger, the sport fish are not going to eat them anymore. So um, they are not supposed to make it through Indiana winters, but somehow they do. And, uh, you know, shad, you know, in our industry, not just us, in our industry, we joke that shad will die if the wind blows the wrong way. Uh, and sometimes uh, that's a true fact. Um, you know, we've seen them jumping and going crazy as we were driving around treating a pond, not because of the chemical at all, but because they were scared from the outboard noise. So it's, it drives us crazy. A lot of shad kills uh, throughout the season um, that we have to clean up. Um, and that's, you know, the problem on the right. So, you know, fish kills are something, unfortunately, that that's going to happen whether you are treating a pond or not treating a pond. Um, you know, like I said, it, it's just going to get over flooded with too many fish. Uh, it's not built to sustain fish life. It's going to have low oxygen levels in it. Um, a pond can turn over where you're going to have a, an oxygen heavy layer at the surface, a cold oxygen depleted layer at the bottom. Uh, you'll get a cold rain. It compresses that, flips the pond. Uh, what that does is it makes the entire pond low on dissolved oxygen and the fish have nowhere to go. So, you know, no one likes to see dead fish, including us, uh, because we have to make reports, uh, turn them into the uh, office of the Indiana State Chemist. Um, so, you know, no one likes to see it, uh, but sometimes it, it's something that, that just happens uh, and we have to take care of it and clean it up um, and get moving on with it. So. Um, uh, aeration, you know, a lot of people talk to us about aeration fountains. If I put a fountain in my pond, uh, will it take care of the algae? No. Um, we sell fountains for aesthetics only. Uh, you're going to get some aeration and some water movement from a fountain, but in all honesty, it's very little. Uh, it's all at the surface, which is already getting aerated just by the natural wind, uh, movement in the pond. And, um, uh, you know, the biggest thing with, with fountains is, you know, it's an expensive investment. So, I mean, you have to understand, you know, there's a lot of maintenance and things like that that can go into that as well. So, uh, you know, a fountain is great for looks, uh, but if you're trying to 
look for something to maintain the health of the pond. Uh, you know, a fountain really is not it. Aeration. Um, if you're debating between a fountain and submerged aeration, uh, we would always recommend submerged aeration and any pond care uh, company should. Now, obviously you don't get any uh, aesthetic value out of it. As you can see, all you see is the, the surface boil off to the left there. You know, once again, a uh, question, if I put aeration in, what, is that an, an algae solution? No, you know, if putting an aeration system in or a fountain in the pond uh, was a simple, you know, solution to take care of algae and weeds, companies like ours wouldn't be in business. Um, you know, it, it's unfortunately, it's not that easy. Um, now an aeration system has you know, several benefits. And this is something, like I said, that we would definitely recommend over a fountain if you weren't looking for aesthetics, you're just looking for health. It's gonna boost the dissolved oxygen level. It helps the thermocline, which I talked about where you'll get that oxygen heavy layer at the top, oxygen depleted layer at the bottom. It helps mix all the water, as you can see from the picture in the middle. Uh, it's gonna release a lot of the trapped gases that get down into the bottom and stuck in the muck. And another thing it's gonna do is it's gonna promote healthy aerobic uh, bacteria growth. That aerobic bacteria growth is gonna help break down some of the organic material that's on the bottom of the pond, which in turn can uh, be you know, fuel for algae and weed growth. Like I said, it's, not, it's a retention pond, so it's not gonna take care of all of it, but it can break down you know, some of that to help reduce it a little bit. Uh, and then, like I said, it's gonna take out the thermal climb. Uh, it's gonna reduce the risk of a fish kill because you're gonna be adding oxygen to the entire body of water. And then just a you know, quick uh, request for a proposal. Uh, you know, somebody you know, was looking for uh, a pond care quote. You know, the things that we're gonna be looking for are you know, the name of the property, who our contact person is gonna be, you know, where is it located? If somebody has a property map, something like this, uh, very great uh, helpful benefit for us. You know, we can see all the ponds right there. Phone number, email address. The email address is just so that we can get you the quote faster. We don't use it for anything else. Number of ponds, if you're interested in the fountains or aeration. And then if you have, you know, concerns like, hey, you know, I have a ton of algae growth, uh, a ton of weed growth, whatever it may be, if you, you know, relay that to us, you know, it just helps the process go a little bit quicker. Our turnaround time for a proposal we have a, uh, an estimator who's out daily running estimates. So uh, it's usually only a few days before we can get that proposal back to you. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Um, just a quick note, we have, uh, we had another section regarding RFPs for landscaping. And I'm not sure, uh, Michael, if it was for ponds, but um, Michael's going to go ahead and just make sure that that information is emailed out to all the participants. Um, Kevin, mm -hmm. a couple questions. Some of them you've already answered. Um, mm -hmm. Should we install buffer strips of native shrubs and grasses around retention ponds to keep fertilizer, animal waste, et cetera? You, from you, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can, you just have to be careful because, you know, all that is really going to do with that buffer strip is take away the nutrients, you know, coming from the area that's right there. Um, it's not going to do anything for the giant culvert pipes that are, you know, flooding in nutrients from the entire neighborhood. So, um, you know, that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is you have to be careful as well because those buffer strips and, and that vegetation and then that native growth you know, they're going to be planted very close to the shoreline. You know, where are they going to get their water from? They're going to pull it from that retention pond. So, um, you know, some of the herbicides that we have to use to treat the submersed weeds in the pond, we can make a treat treatment for those, not targeting, you know, that, that native plant growth outside of the pond or at the edge. Uh, but, you know, if it's pulling up some of that water from the pond, sometimes it can be detrimental to those plants. So it, it's, a very, uh, it's a very delicate balance uh, on what you want to put there and if it's really going to be effective. Like I said, it's, the culvert pipes are the biggest thing, you know, where, where those nutrients are coming in. 
and that buffer zone really doesn't doesn't do anything for those. Okay. Um, any this comes up as far as to managers a lot about mowing right up to the edge of the pond. Any benefit to having a non mow buffer of three or six feet, or mow every two or thir three times? I mean, it it just depends. I mean, you know, a lot of people don't like to leave it because of the look, you know, which we understand. So, um, you know, we tell neighborhoods if the if they can ask the mowing crews to uh, blow away from the pond, you know, so that you're not directly, you know, putting you know a bunch of the grass uh, and nutrients directly into the pond. That's obviously beneficial. Um, but we understand, you know, we work with landscapers. We're subbed out by some. You know, we understand that, you know, weeding and things like that, there's nothing that they can do, you know, to stop the grass from getting into the pond in those circumstances. So we know some of it's going to get in there. But any of it that you can avoid, you know, easily, like I said, by, you know, blowing it away as they're mowing with the riders, you know, that's definitely going to be, you know, beneficial to start with. Okay. Any pond plants that you recommend for aesthetics? Um, it depends. I mean, you know, plants are really the, uh, they're really uh, like a, a hot topic, you know, in, in our business because, you know, we get calls to basically spray them and kill them off most of the time. Uh, whereas, you know, some people love them. You know, I don't think cattails are that bad. Uh, you know, they're, they're easy to maintain. Um, if you want us to just selectively spray them, you know, we can. Um, you know, arrowhead, a sweet flag, you know, there's, there's some things that you can plant around there, you know, that, that aren't that bad, you know, if you're okay, you know, with the look, uh, to be honest, um, you know, I've been here 17 years. Most people want their pond to look like a swimming pool. Uh, you know, they, they want nothing in it, no algae, no weeds, nothing around the edge. So it really depends on the neighborhood you know, what they're truly looking for. Okay, great. Um, I, I know there's a couple other questions, Kevin, mm -hmm. so I'm going to have you stay on and okay. we'll try to answer them. So everyone knows uh, the list of questions that we have gone over um, will be also sent in an email blast with the answers. If there is something we missed, because sometimes I kind of get lost in all the questions, which thank you so much for participating. Um, Please feel free to reach out to Aaron, Jonathan, or Kevin with your questions. Um, as promised, we are going to give away two gift cards. The winners tonight are Jerry Maines with Meadow Bend Homeowners Association. The second one will be, uh, and we will be mailing these to you. And the second winner is Audrey LaSalle Brown out of uh, Michigan at the North Park Cooperative. So that's great. Thank you, Audrey, for uh, participating tonight and everyone from Michigan tonight as well. Um, the next is seminar that we will be having is Legal Pitfalls to Avoid. So I will be presenting this on May 3rd at 6 o'clock, and I will be joined by a panel of attorneys to answer your questions. Uh, we'll have three attorneys attending that night. And the, again, the topic will be legal pitfalls to avoid. We really appreciate your attendance tonight. Had a great, great group. And, and thank you to Kevin, Jonathan, and Aaron. And uh, Michael, do you have anything to add? No, I, uh, I agree. Thank you very much, guys, for participating. Um, the knowledge is very beneficial to us and our boards. So thank you very much. Right. So if the presenters can just stay on for a few minutes and uh, we'll let everyone else enjoy your evening. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Um, Kevin, I don't know if you saw um, Wade ask, curious to know what is a long-term maintenance schedule on a retention pond and um, if that's more detailed or if there's something you want to send me on that. I can send well, it on the email blast. Yeah, I mean, it it depends really on on what he's looking for. I mean, the long term answer is, I mean, unfortunately, you're going to constantly have to maintain it. It's not something that that you can, like I said, just put in, uh, you know, some type of system and and not have to to worry about it anymore. You know, if somebody were to ask me outside of the basic maintenance of algae and weeds, what's one thing I can do, you know, to help you know, that maintain that uh, good health of the pond, 
the first thing that I would always, always recommend is the submerged aeration system. There are so okay. many benefits to that, uh, putting that into a body of water that, you know, you're going to get your, your biggest bang for your buck out of that than you are for anything else in terms of, uh, you know, the initial cost of it, the electrical cost of it, the maintenance of it um, versus, you know, what you truly get out of it uh, in gains for the health of the pond uh, is by far the, the best option outside of the normal maintenance for a pond. Okay. Um, and then I saw somebody asked about Phragmites. Uh, yeah. you know, that, that's an invasive plant as well. So um, you would want to spray that before you did any removal, you'd want to spray it just like you would the cattails. Um, and then once it's dead, uh, the same thing, just like a cattail, you can cut it off, you know, at or below the surface level of the water uh, and remove and remove it. Okay, I'm sorry, what did you say? <laughs> cut it off below surface, right? Yeah, at or below the surface level, um, depending on what type of, you know, machinery you're using to cut it off. But you want to make sure that you spray it first. If you just go down there and cut it all off, it's just going to come right back up. Okay. Spray what? You just want to spray it. You want to treat it. Okay. Okay. And um, as the other presenters know, uh, Michael got away with it tonight and did not do any presentation. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I that's saw great. It. Thank you so much. I, th I thought she just skimmed right over it. She pretty much did. Yeah. <laughs> he was supposed to present, and I said to him, no, you're out. Yeah. And uh, he has to leave for vacation early in the morning, so I didn't want to stress him out too much. But when he gets back, he's taking me to lunch. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. Good. <laughs> right. Oh, but thank you so much. Um, we really, really appreciate KMC does, and thank you for, you know, th there's times that you guys help us out so much, and, and we appreciate the long-term service that you give all of our managers. So um, I think that's it. And hopefully, you know, everyone will email you directly okay. and uh, let us know if you guys have any other concerns or something comes up that's sent to you, just let us know. Not Michael, he'll be on vacation. <laughs> so, yep. all right, with that, thanks a lot. And I will see you all soon. Thank all you right. guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Bye.